Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we'll be taking a look through one of my favourite authors, Graham Greene. Now I've got a fairly decent collection of pre-1970 vintage paperbacks in Penguin and in Pam, and that's what we're going to be having a look at today. Um, I've also got um, a five or so spare Graham Greene titles, which I'd like to give away at the end in a bit of a competition. So do hang around for that. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's take a look. Henry Graham Greene was born in October 1904. He was an English writer and journalist, regarded by many as one of the leading English novelists of the 20th century. Combining literary acclaim with widespread popularity, Greene acquired a reputation early in his lifetime as a major writer, both of serious Catholic novels and of thrillers or entertainments as he termed them. He was shortlisted in 1966 and 1967 for the Nobel Prize for Literature. Through 67 years of writing, which included over 25 novels, he explored the conflicting moral and political issues of the modern world. He was awarded the 1968 Shakespeare Prize and the 1981 Jerusalem Prize. He died in 1991 at age 86 of leukaemia. OK, then, so we'll start off with my earliest Graham Greene in paperback, which is this one. It's 1914. It's a battlefield, and this uh, was published as Penguin main series 257 here and um, like all the sort of penguins of this time it came in a in a dust wrapper there we are and it's kept the uh, the original book in uh, extraordinarily nice condition considering this is uh, 80 years old now um, and he got off to quite an early he was popular from the start shall we say graham green and uh, i think uh, he uh, not a lot of authors can say that, you know, from their earliest work, works, they were instantly a bit of a hit. But I think then he paced himself throughout his career. Um, a little little positive biography there at the back, which Penguin used to do, you know, born in October 1904. Um, and his first publications, Man, The Man Within, Name of the Action, Stamball Train, Basement Room and a Gun for Sale. Married in 1927. So this is very much a, a wartime one here. And um, if they give a little summary of the book, I will sort of read that as we go along. Uh, for it's about and filled, doesn't really say, it's just a couple of reviews there from The Spectator, uh, Time and Tide and Sunday Referee. An adventurous book, above all intelligent without sacrificing sympathy. Genuinely modern, all I've read for a very long time. It's exciting to read it. Well, there we are. It's a bit of a classic and... Um, it was, it was only in Penguin for a short while, um, and then it moved over to Pam. But we'll see that one a little bit later. But that's like the sort of the first book there. Now, the next one is probably, although it's early on, it's, it's my favourite one of Graham Greene's, and it's a Brighton Rock. Now, this is notoriously difficult to find in uh, Penguin First Edition. This is the first edition, and mine is quite fragile. It's got a very uh, sort of mottled there, mottled spine, and it's just about being held together. But it is indeed... The first from, uh, was it 19, 1943? So it was printed during the, the height of the Blitz under paper rationing. So consequently, copies nowadays are very, very difficult to find in first edition. Even the second edition of this, which is quite similar to in appearance, um, tends to go for um, good money. I honestly would think this is, you know, probably by far the most expensive book we'll see today. And um, copies of this one in first edition easily change hands for about £100 now. Um, there is an even rarer edition, which is one that was published for the Forces Book Club of Brighton Rock, and that's legendary scarce. And you could probably put your own price on that one. I'd say it's probably Graham Greene's rarest book, and it's the Penguin Forces Book Club edition. I will pop a picture of that one up uh, right now. Um, and I would expect that one to go for about 500 but even this one, in its state, you know, as the first edition, still very, very expensive. And the second is equally uh, rare. You can, however, get them in this nice, the classic tri-band Penguin editions uh, very cheaply. If you're willing to accept it, like an edition from sort of the later 19, 1940s. I have got a second copy of Brighton Rock. And uh, this is uh, released as the Penguin Modern Classics one. And this was obviously a lot, lot later. And uh, this is from 62, this one, but it's still got the very early signs of the modern classic sort of branding. And uh, 
I'll just read you a little bit about the, on the back here. So Pinky, the boy with death at his fingertips, was not just bad. He worshipped in the temple of evil as his parents had worshipped in the house of God. Crime in his dark mind was a release so deep and satisfying that he had no need for drink or women or the love of his fellows. He is an astounding character, sinister and fascinating. In Brighton Rock, there is a deep mystery and yet... It is no mystery story. Here is a rare adventure and yet more than an adventure tale, a psychological action story. It is the literature of excitement distilled from a rare blending of mood, scene and character, a novel which, when it is finished, seems to have been injected into the veins. What fantastic blurb that was, wasn't it? Absolutely brilliant. Um, it is a book that once you've read it, and like a lot of these Graham Greene titles that we'll see today, I mean, this is actually one of the longer ones. Most of them are very, very short, you know, barely 150 pages. This one is actually one of the longer ones. How long is this? Yeah, 250. Um, once you've read it, you really won't forget it. And I do also recommend the uh, the 50s black and white uh, movie ad adaptation, which has got... Um, uh, William Hartnell in, uh, quite a young William Hartnell as the bad guy and uh, Richard Attenborough, I believe. And uh, that's that's really terrific as well. Now, here is another rarity. This is The Confidential Agent, um, and this is a services edition. So this is published by Guild Books. Um, now, this was one which didn't get sent to any armed forces, which was the intention of these books, because it's got the, the remnants of this sticker. Uh, and what that sticker said was that this edition was surplus to requirements and has been authorised to be sold through WH Smith at um, uh, a shilling a, a pop. And uh, that's what this was. So you see it's distributed through the Central uh, Services Central Book Depot for the fighting forces of the Allied Nations. So yeah, this wasn't designed initially to be sold in any bookshop at all, just sent overseas to wherever there are uh, English uh, English speaking troops. Um, overseas, posted overseas into prisoner of war camps, wherever, um, so that they could have a bit of a, um, a bit of classic Graham Greene. So this was a Guild Books number S9, so it's special number nine, I guess. It's got some of his early stuff there as well. So quite a rarity, that one. Not mega money, not like the, the Penguin Forces book club, but still quite, quite rare. Now, the next one we got is this one, The Lawless Roads, and this is from 1947. And this is in the cerise colours, which denotes Penguin's uh, travel um, and adventure series. Now, with this one, um, and I think for a long, long time, this is what caused Graham Greene to sort of fall out with Penguin, because on the spine, famously, they misspelled his, his surname. Look, they left the E off the green of green which was a bit of a mistake. But, I mean, they were just coming out of, I think these are just at the very tail end of the war. These were published in 1947. So it was just an oversight more than anything. But um, it obviously cheesed him off. Um, I've not had chance to read in the archive if um, what the sort of the to and fro and was from uh, um, between Penguin and Green himself about this. But um, he was evidently a bit cheesed off because his next few books end up with Pan and he didn't really come back to Penguin until the early 1960s. But there's uh, there's the lawless rose. As I said that's a that's a travel one there, a little updated uh, biography of Green. Lovely. So that's the lawless rose, and then this is the first pan. So it's a very early pan. It's number thirteen in the pan numbered series. It's Journey Without Maps, and once again this is uh, like a travel travel one so it says yeah graham green records his travel on foot through 300, 350 miles of roadless and diseased infested forest in the west african black republic of liberia which he entered from the british protectorate of sierra leone so he he sort of these are sort of like this experiences provide the backdrop for quite a few of his books later on um i wouldn't say this is one to rush out and read today um i would sort of stick to the sort of the bigger entertainments as he calls them the, the, the better stories but um if you get really into him then uh, you'll want to read his uh, his sort of travel writing as well um he is that sort of an author which if you get the bug you do sort of want to go to read everything because he they are so good they're really well written so next one we got is a pan again it's number 220 in pan's main series in Istanbul train really nice evocative cover there by sax Stumble Train is among those of his novels which Graham Greene has called entertainments. There we are. The separating them from his more serious books. 
It tells a story confined to a period of a few days of a group of people thrown together by chance as passengers in the Orient Express speeding across Europe. So it's nothing to do with the Agatha Christie Orient Express, but it is indeed set on that one. And it's the Stambol train. Here we are. And these are like pan editions. In fact, all the books we'll see going forward now are really, really quite easy to get. I mean, not always that easy to find in really nice condition, but they're not going to be too hard to find if, if you're uh, determined to, to track them down. So here's um, the pan edition of It's a Battlefield. Now, this one came out in 1953. So admittedly, it is um, a good 13 years since the uh, the Penguin edition was in print, first of all. Um, but you can see how it's changed. And as I said, I think he must have fallen out with Penguin for getting his name wrong there on the uh, on the spine. And he just, uh, for paperback um, releases, he just said, well, I'm just going to put them to pan. Um, let's not forget that he was still selling very well in hardback. And um, if a if an author was still doing well in hardback, why change, really? Um, you know, get the hardback sales. So it says about It's a Battlefield is a novel whose main theme is the waste and error and pain involved in the carrying out of justice. A London bus driver, Jim Drover, has been sentenced to death for killing a policeman at a rowdy communist meeting in Hyde Park. Various people are implicated in the case, some directly, some indirectly, but they are like isolated groups of soldiers on a battlefield who fight in ignorance of the general plan of action or of an overall fortunes. Good stuff. Good, good stuff. It's a battlefield. Next, we've got another pan here which is England Made Me, quite a patriotic sort of cover, this one. That's 1954. Very, very nice one. Another one by Sachs again. It's the same artist as the earlier one. England Made Me is one of the most generally praised of Graham Greene's novels because of its skillful construction, its style and its characterization. It depicts a group of people who live all in lonely isolation, physically and spiritually. Good stuff. Now, this is uh, The Third Man and Fallen Idol by Graham Greene, and it's um, it says two stories that made famous films. And uh, I believe Graham Greene was the like the scriptwriter for The Third Man. I'm not sure about The Fallen Idol. Um, so it says on the back here, there can be few filmgoers who have not seen The Third Man with its unforgettable Harry Lyme, zither tune that forms the background music and many people remember to the fallen idol both these outstanding films are written by graham green and directed by sir carol reed for sir alexander corder the story of the third man was never intended for publication but it had to be written so that the film could be based and built upon it this volume contains the original version many cuts and changes were later made some of them owing to the requirements of the international authorities in Vienna, from whom permission to shoot the film there had to be obtained. Graham Greene tells in the preface how years before he had jotted down on the flap of an envelope an opening paragraph for a story, a man suddenly sees in a crowd a friend whose burial he had attended the previous week. This idea he used for the highly dramatic plot of The Third Man, which, set in devastated Vienna just after the war, is concerned with the penicillin racket. The photograph on the front cover shows Orson Welles as Harry Lyme in the film, a London film production. Look at that, how cool is that, eh? Now, my copy's certainly not mint, and it's got a bit of a bit of a faded spine there, but it is a really, really nice edition, and um, one I think, if you're going to go for Graham Green, I think you want to add that particular one to your collection. It's not, not difficult to find, but as I said, like a lot of these, the books are out there, and they're quite common, but it's uh, finding them in, in nice condition that can be tough. Now, Journeys Without Maps actually got re-released by Pan as a giant, as a great Pan rather, so GP number 57. And it came out with a new illustrated cover by uh, K. And uh, this one's got a photo insert. This is just reprinting that earlier one that we saw there. So yeah, first printed, uh, it was reprinted, printed by Pan in 48 and reprinted in 49. And this new edition, which is what we got here, is the reset edition from 1957. And it says uh, just a little bit about it. So this is the record of Graham Greene's travels on foot through 350 miles of roadless and disease infected forest in the West African Black Republic of Liberia, which he entered from the British protectorate of Sierra Leone. There we are. So that is what that one's about. OK, so that was the end of the pan run. 
and uh, he then moved over at long last to Penguin. And Penguin, I think, must have, you know, there was probably a bit of a change of editorial direction back then, and uh, they were able to perhaps coax him back to becoming um, a Penguin order, um, author. Pan, at this point, sort of went into more towards the sensationalist fiction, whereas Penguin books became more literary and a tiny bit more highbrow. And I think perhaps that was possibly what Graham Greene was hoping that his books would be regarded at, um, as entertainments, but also, you know, quite highbrow. So this is five years since that one. This is 1962. Um, and that was a year when Penguin published five or six Graham Greens, all sort of within a, a like, probably just like one a month throughout the year. So this is uh, Lost Childhood. It has a little updated bibliography there. The cover drawing for this one is by John Ward. And uh, this is a collection of uh, uh, essays and short stories, I believe under the yeah there we are under the overall title of the lost childhood so um, and here he is you're looking at different um authors basically you're looking at yeah, henry james uh, on dickens there so uh, walter de la Mare. so yeah this is his one that he looks at other other authors which is good stuff so stuff like that it's a, it's a perfect sort of introduction to graham Reed. it's a good way to sort of dip in and out of uh of his style of writing. Next we've got The End of the Affair and this is also from 1962 and uh, this starts a run of covers by uh, Hogarth I believe. I think they usually credit him at the front by Paul Hogarth. Yes a cover drawn by Paul Hogarth so a lot of the books around this sort of time now are going to have these uh, Paul, Paul Hogarth jackets and they're sort of um, like little sort of watercolour sort of affairs like blobs of of uh in a, like almost like an impressionist but they do sort of give a hint of what's what's sort of to come so reading the back of this one then the end of the affair is distinct from any other major novel by graham green this frank intense account of a love affair and its mystical aftermath is set not abroad but in a suburb of london and told with the intimate informality of the first person the strange and callous steps by a middle-aged writer to destroy or perhaps to reclaim the mistress who had unaccountably left him 18 months before make a story which is by turns passionate, comical and pathetic. Here from the author of a pre-war bestseller is a book as wholly post-war as Room at the Top. So there you go. That is the end of the affair. Next we're on to The Heart of the Matter. Another real, real classic one. Also one that's actually one of the longer ones again. Uh, yeah, 263. I said the majority of the ones we'll see going out now are all sort of, you know, just over 150 pages. So you can get through them in like a couple of sittings quite, quite easily. Uh, once again, this one's got the uh, distinctive uh, Paul Hogarth uh, jacket on it. He does get a little credit there down the bottom. So in the heart of the matter, is considered by many to be Graham Greene's finest book. It is a study of a personality in disintegration. Henry Scoble, Deputy Commissioner of Police in a West African colony during the war, is the target of idle slander and official spying. His wife is a social failure. Passed over for promotion, he takes questionable steps to send her on leave, and gradually the semen integrity of his character begins to crumble until, beset by guilt, Deprived of trust, fallen from his state of grace, he methodically consigns himself to an eternity in hell. <laughs> there we are, that's the heart of the matter. Absolutely stonking copy of that one. Very, very nice indeed. Next is, is my second favourite of his after Brighton Rock, and that's Our Man in Havana. Um, lovely Hogarth cover on this one again. Also 1962, as I said, they, uh, they published quite a few Penguin around this time in the early 1960s. So Our Man in Havana is rated by its author not as a novel, but as an entertainment, as we've seen before. It is all of that. Indeed, it is a real pleasure to watch Graham Greene defy the customs and take the mickey out of Bond as in James Bond, of course. Uh, these were very popular at the time, the Bond books. So when Mr. Warmold quietly selling vacuum cleaners in Havana was rudely plugged into the new Caribbean network of the British Secret Service. A series of blinding flashes suggested there was more than just sugar in Cuba. London took the shocks, but Wormwald took the money. <laughs> um, and a little quote from Ian Fleming on the back there. This is brilliant and utterly compulsive reading. 
Ian Fleming. I believe, obviously, the two did know each other. They were both uh, best-selling authors at this time. Um, it's just not surprising that Fleming put a little little quote on the back there. Um, here's another absolute classic, really, The Power and the Glory. He really was uh, sort of pumping them out at this point. Another um, beautiful Penguin copy. And these are all consecutive Penguin numbers, and it does actually mention down the bottom there, Five of Graham Greene's best-known books are being published simultaneously in Penguins in 1962, and details will be found at the end of this book. And uh, there they are. So they reprinted Brighton Rock in the uh, in the, the modern classics edition that we've seen there. End of the Affair, Heart of the Matter, Lost Children, Our Man in Havana, and The Quiet America. And they're all published at the same time as, as this book. So in The Power and the Glory, it says, In one of the southern states of Mexico during an anti-clerical purge, the last priest, like a, a, haunt, a hunted hare, is on the run. Too human for heroism, too humble for martyrdom. The little worldly whiskey priest is nevertheless impelled towards his squalid cavalry, as much by his own compassion for humanity as by the efforts of his pursuers. A baleful vulture of doom hovers over this modern crucifixion story, but above the vulture soars an eagle. Hmm, there we go, the power and the glory. Now, the next one for some people is what they, a lot of people say that this is a really good entry point for Graham Greene. I would suggest this, or if you like a traditional sort of crime novel, maybe Brian Rock, but it's very, very short, The Quiet American, and uh, the story is just, well, it's just really, really great. And you can see it's it's very, very easy read these. And um, Penguin have done just the absolute best job with these particular editions from the 60s. They're just the sort of books I love to read. The typesetting is immaculate. The feel of the book in the hand is great. They're just pleasant on the eye to read. They, you know, These are some of the best Penguins um, that ever got published. In my opinion, this particular period of Penguin is great. So in The Quiet American is a terrifying portrait of innocence at large, while the French army in Indochina is grappling with the Viet Ninh back at Saigon, a young and high-minded American begins to channel economic aid to a third force. The narrator, a seasoned foreign correspondent, is forced to observe, I never knew a man who had better motives for all the trouble he caused. As young Pyle's policies blunder on into bloodshed, the older man finds it impossible to stand aside as an observer, but his motives for intervening are suspect, both to the police and to himself. For Pyle, he has also robbed him of his animite mistress. There we are. And some very positive reviews there from The Guardian, The Statesman and The News Chronicle. So there we are. So anyway, that I don't think that really sort of gives a very good summary of it. But um, I think if you dip into the Quiet American, it's uh, it's a really good one to sort of start out with. So next we've got a burnt out case. Now this is also uh, this one moved over into 1963 now, but all the hallmarks are the same. So these initial ones um, sold very very well. So uh, they obviously carried on and did another batch. And this is uh, also with the Paul Hogarth. Uh, sort of lined out drawings there for a burnt out case. Yeah, there we are. Cover drawing by Paul Hogarth, but this has now moved over to 1963. And let's see. Um, yeah, it does mention some of the next ones coming out. So uh, it doesn't say all published at the same time, though, but it does say five more, five more books by Graham Greene and Alan in Penguins, in addition to his five great novels, which appeared together in Penguin in the autumn of 1962. So the new ones are The Confidential Agent, A Gun for Sale, Ministry of Fear, and Stambol Train. And then it gives the numbers of the other ones there, which were all consecutive. So we'll have a look at these now. So this is a burnt out case. Graham Greene's latest novel, to some, may seem a stark and pessimistic comment on humanity in a despairing fling to have done with the world and women and fame, a well-known architect buries himself at an isolated leper colony in the Belgian Congo. He is recognisable by his mutilated mind as a burnt-out case, a mental leper through whom the disease has run its course. In his relations with his native servant, with the colony's doctor and its Catholic fathers, Quarry discovers a sort of sunset piece but the outside world is tragically incapable of leaving the story there. There you go. That was a burnt out case. Next we've got The Confidential Agent. 
and this is also from 1963. Uh, one of the saw the watercolour Paul Hogarth there with the staircase coming down. There we are. So, the confidential agent, a continental government with a civil war on its hands, sends D, a former lecturer in Romance languages, to England to buy coal at almost any price. Failure means defeat, but D has hardly landed before force, corruption and treachery gather around him. He is pursued both by the English police and the rebels agents. The progress of story, which in places is as tense as the third man, is effectively lightened by incidents of humour worthy of our man in Havana. There we are, one of his uh, most famous ones, the confidential agent. Now we've got a gun for sale. Nice street scene there from Hogarth. Bit of foxing on my one on the page edges, but it says for a gun for sale. Written as a thriller, a gun for sale is also notable for its very thorough dissection of a criminal mind. Indeed, in Raven, the professional gunman of this story, Graham Greene sketched the character of Pinky, the juvenile gangster in Brighton Rock, his next novel. By assassinating a foreign minister of war, Raven improves the market for armaments. He is paid in stolen notes. Bent on revenge, he traces the parties who hired him to a Midland city, where the police, with the police on his heels, in this tortuous double hunt, the outlaw becomes the unwitting weapon of a kind of social justice. There we are, a gun for sale. I know that's a, that is a particularly good one. Um, this is, uh, once again, it's in my top five Graham Greens. This is the Ministry of Fear. Um, a slightly longer book than, than normal. Um, and certainly uh, um, a very collectible hardback first edition, this particular one. From the Blitz on London, Graham Greene gathered up the pieces of what must be his most phant phantasmagoric study in terror. Arthur Rose was a mind hamstrung by guilt, the guilt of having mercifully murdered his sick wife. He was standing aside from the war until he happened to guess both the true and the false weight of the cake at a charity fate. From that moment he was quarry of malign and shadowy forces, from which he endeavoured to escape with a mind that was out of focus. <laughs> the Ministry of Fear. There we are. Next, we've got the Penguin edition of Stamboul Train, which uh, you know we saw earlier as a pan edition, so Penguin had got the rights by this time. This particular one is quite nice. It's got um, a little um, advanced review slip in here. So the enclosed book will be published by Penguin on the 28th of March, 63. And uh, Stamboul Train number 1898, that was the Penguin series number. We request your cooperation in not publishing any notice or review before the date shown above. A copy of any notice would be appreciated. So there's a little hand-typed um, little review slip that was sent out. So this was a review copy. Very, very nice. And it says, In this early novel, Graham Greene proved his mastery of the tense plot of intrigue among a ring of sharply drawn characters. The action takes place on the Orient Express as it draws across Europe from Ostend to Constantinople. There we are. Well, we sort of knew the plot from that, from the Pam book, didn't we? But um, it's still a classic. Now, that was it for a little while then, until 1967. So you can see the Penguin style has very, very much changed. And they're sort of 66, 67. They did go a little bit funky. And um, Alan Lane's sort of influence as artistic director had long, long gone. And a chap called Tony Godwin was was running the show. And he was, a uh, you know, he was a bit more of his time, basically. A bit more hip, a bit more trendy. Um... So that's why all the sort of penguins from this period are as they are. So published in 1966 in hardback as the, by the body head, this was uh, his latest, or um, it was the, the first paperback edition of The Comedians. And yeah, look, his first novel in five years, a blazing bestseller set in tropical, tyrannical Haiti. So let's read the book. Brown, Smith and Jones, Hotelier, Crusading vegetarian and phony major are uneasy visitors to Haiti, tourist playground turned brutal dictatorship. They are the comedians, men standing aside from any real responsibility. Unlike Dr. Maggio, Negro leader of an underground movement in revolt against Papa Doc de Ladier and his sinister regime of searches, torture and sudden death. Blimey. 
There we are. Um, although this is one I've not read, I do hear very good things about it. Apparently it's very good, so uh, that might be one to try. It took me a while to find that one in the first edition. Next is A Sense of Reality. So this is um, Penguin number 2821, and it's from 1968. And it says, look, on the front, there, a collection of four stories comprising Under the Garden, a short novel, A Visit to Morin, Dream of a Strange Land, and A Discovery in the Woods. Now, it's got um, that same artist there, Paul Hogarth, but it's literally just like a sketch, isn't it, more than anything else? Not exactly as gorgeous as the uh, the 60s ones. In these four stories, Graham Greene, one of the masters of modern English fiction, has allowed himself the liberty of fantasy, myth, legend and dream. The results are quite simply superb. So there we are. Look at this. It's only 111 pages. So they are basically four slightly longer than short stories um, padded out and put together to uh, to make the book. But he was obviously you know, a bestseller in any new Grand Green would call for celebration. So that's, I guess, why they published it. Now, the next thing we've got is May We Borrow Your Husband. So this is Penguin. It's actually ISBN, but it's that period where um, you could tell the Penguin numbers. This is Penguin 3030, and it's from 1969. Uh, Paul Hogarth cover again, a little PH down there. And it's just that like, it's, it's sort of... Yeah, not nowhere near as nice as the beautiful sort of watercoloured ones. This is almost just like a sketch. So Mary Borrow Your Husband and Other Comedies of Sexual Life. Famous author William Harris is spending the fag end of the season and Antibes finishing his first attempt at, his, at historical biography. But he becomes more interested and involved in the antics of two homosexual interior, dec interior decorators intent on stealing Poppy Travis's honeymoon husband which leaves him free to fall in love with Poppy herself. A widow and a divorcee tipsily discuss the inadequacy of men in general and their husbands in particular, deciding women have much more to offer each other by way of a variety in sexual love. A wife holidays alone in Jamaica's cheap season, idly hoping for excitement, but finding the only man she can have an affair with is far too old and frightened of the dark. Affairs, obsessions, grand passions and tiny ardours, this collection contains some of Green's saddest observations on the hilarity of sex. <laughs> well, there you are. I think you pretty much know what you're going to be getting into if you were to uh, to give that one a try. So the final one in my sort of vintage collection here is 21 Stories. This is, although the last vintage paperback to show you today, apart from the ones I've got to give away in a minute, um... He did indeed write a few more books uh, up until uh, the, the tail end of his life, basically. I've not gone on to get those yet, but I, I do intend to finish off the run because they're not difficult to find the few that came out in the uh, sort of the later 70s and 80s. But this is 21 Stories. This one came out in 1970 by Penguin. Paul, Paul Hogarth again. And uh, in the basement room, filmed as the fallen idol, a small boy witnesses something that blights his whole life like the other stories in this book written between 1929 and 1954 it hinges on the themes which dominate graham green's novels fear pity and violence pursuit betrayal and man's restless search for salvation sometimes the stories are comic poor mr maling's stomach mysteriously broadcasts all sorts of sounds sometimes wryly sad a youthful indiscretion catches up with Mr. Carter in the blue film. Sometimes deeply shocking, a gang of children systematically destroy a man's house while he's on holiday. And sometimes hauntingly tragic, a strange relationship between twins reaches its climax at a children's party. But whatever the mood, each one is compellingly en compelling entertainment, unmistakably the work of the finest storyteller of our time. There we are, and this is 21 short Graham Greene stories. I wouldn't say he was the best short story writer ever out there, but they are excellent. And uh, this is one that, you know, you should track down for sure. Brilliant stuff. Okay, so as I mentioned at the start, I have got five vintage Graham Greens to give away today. These are all first edition, first Penguin editions. As you can see, some of them are quite nice condition. And some of them got a little bit of wear. This is a later edition of The Confidential Agent. So to win these, um, the competition will be open from one month from when this video goes live. Um, all you need to do is obviously be a subscriber to the channel. Give this video a positive thumbs up. Leave a comment down below with what your favourite 
Graham Greene title is or one that you'd most like to read if you've not read any. Um, and if you can, if you could share this video on your social media, either Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you have any sort of social media. Um, and then let me know when you've done that in the comments down below. Then I'll compile all those comments together and um, I'll pull a win winner at random um, in about a month or, th or so's time. And if you have one, I shall message you through uh, the comment section on YouTube to let you know. Um, it's open to anybody anywhere in the world. I'm happy to send these uh, wherever you may be. Um, so there you go. Hope you've enjoyed looking through my vintage collection of Graham Greene paperbacks. If you have, do please give the video that thumbs up. Do leave a comment below with your favourite Green novel. And good luck if you are entering the competition. Thanks very much for watching today and I'll see you again very soon. Bye.